First of all, thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm Egyptian, and I have many of time come to attend lectures and events here in this hall, but never been on stage. So for me, it's a nice full circle and surreal moment. But um, I'm also equally proud to come home to Egypt to this event at Art Egypt. Honestly, it's been in a couple of incredible days just seeing everything that they've put together, uh, the installations at the pyramids, the launch event last night, the art walking tour this morning, really plays to the culture of this region. And um, it makes me proud to be Egyptian and to spend so much time here seeing all these international guests come in and enjoy it. Um, but I'm equally excited because Andy Kranak is his first time to Egypt. Andy is the president of vFriends, uh, one of the largest NFT, Web3, and uh, media companies in the world. And uh, I told him, I said, Andy, do you want to come to Egypt and display some vFriends and speak in an event and come to see these art installations at the pyramids? And I didn't think it was that hard to convince him. So I'm um, really grateful that he's here and I get to experience this with him. Um, Andy, do you want to say a few words before we kick off? Thank you for inviting me. Thank you uh, for everyone being here. Um, it's been an amazing two and a half day days so far. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, Maha and I can provide some insights and value about how we've created vFriends, how we think about the future of the internet, and what exactly is an NFT. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about vFriends. So both of us work for Gary Vaynerchuk, who is the creator and founder of vFriends. Gary is a serial entrepreneur who believes in putting happiness and kindness on a pedestal. And one of the ways that he wanted to scale his ideas globally was through characters and through specific traits. And that's why he created vFriends, was to create an IP company where he can scale his ideas because he's only one person, but if he had characters to do stories around. So that was the premise of how they created vFriends. So Andy, why don't you walk us through the early days of the concept, the drawings, and a little bit of how we got to where we are today. Gladly. I would say, even before Gary decided he was gonna create an NFT project company, um, I had never heard about NFTs before, you know. Maybe 2019 I had heard of NBA releasing these digital collectibles, and then in January I started hearing about these NFTs called CryptoPunks, which were selling for like $20,000. And from then on, that was January 2020, Gary had spent almost all of his time, most of his time speaking and talking to people that had been in DeFi, NFTs uh, for the last three or four years since 2017 um, in such a way that I'd never seen him be so singularly focused on one thing. And then once I saw that he was really paying that much attention to it, I realized that it was probably an important thing for me to <laughs> pay attention to. Anyways, he uh, very quickly one weekend texted myself and some other people was like, hey, we're going to go take a trip for a week and I'm going to start drawing and I'm gonna launch a, an NFT project. So we went, and the first thing that Gary and the team did, and, and Maha was there as well, was sort of reverse engineer how Gary wanted to spend his time and or how he wants to provide value. So he always wanted to have his own conference. The core value of vFriends was going to be a ticket to a conference. Then he always, uh, he talks a lot about what celebrities or influencers can really give to their followers and fans and audiences. And the core uh, value is access. Access in ways that you can never experience otherwise. Everyone can buy a Taylor Swift hoodie. Not everyone can go to a studio with Taylor Swift and spend a weekend with her creating her next song. So aside from the conference, we started thinking about um, how does Gary like to spend his time? So we came up with these things called access tokens. There's a, a courtside cat. It's a one-of-one one NFT. If you own courtside cat, you are invited to go courtside to a New York Knicks game once a year for three years. There's a tennis elbow. You play tennis with Gary for, for three hours. There's a gone fishing fish. You go fishing with Gary. Um, and all of that was an exercise in, in really trying to create a blueprint 
you know, V Friends launched in May 2021. It was still pretty early. It was ideal timing to launch a project, but we're hopeful that what we've built at VFriends will be a blueprint 10 years from now when another celebrity or influencer uh, or any project, emerging project, wants to think about how to create value and how to use Web3 and the blockchain uh, to do so. So you talked a little bit about a blueprint. So for a lot of people, you know, it's like, what is an NFT? Why should we care? Why should we own one? It's a JPEG. It doesn't bring any value. It's cryptocurrency. The market is down. There's been a lot of um, speculation and talk and maybe misunderstandings about why the NFT is the vehicle to doing um, access and conferences and events. What would you say to them about that? Tomorrow, we could decide that Anyone who owns the VFriend NFT, the VFriend character, Carrying Camel, there's a 283 characters in VFriends, about 260 NFTs of every character. If we said that everyone who owns the Carrying Camel is coming on a week, all expenses paid trip to Egypt, we could do that. The underlying technology would allow us to look who owns that NFT, have them come to our website, and they can have a once-in-a-lifetime trip and experience. All of that to say is the things that you can do operationally as a business will impact the value of your NFTs. So NFTs allow you to know who your community is and think about ways you can reverse engineer value and success for them. I think one of the things when I came onto the project to, in the early days when Gary was thinking about it, it was how do we explain to people what is an NFT and why they should care and they, why they should buy it. It reminded me when I was in Egypt, I worked for Nagib Sawiris, and we were trying to explain to people why they should buy a mobile. So, like, what's the benefit and have to educate everybody about mobile technology and cell phone and if you guys remember, that was the very first tagline. And so I think the education part on NFTs is really important about what it is, how does it work, why should we invest, how do you avoid getting scammed, because it is, it is different. It is a new industry. And I'm going to just, I want to talk a few minutes about Web3 because a lot of people talk about NFTs in Web3. So Web1 was when the inter internet was introduced. Web2, social media. Web3 really essentially is about blockchain technology. So when a lot of people heard about NFTs, they thought it was just digital art. Just like when we thought we heard about the internet, we thought it was just search engines. And we learned it was so much more. It was social media, e-commerce, that type of thing. What is the significance of the blockchain technology, either for your NFT project or Web3? Yeah, I'll just piggyback off of how you sort of articulated Web1, Web2, Web3. You know, I think Web1, and I heard this on a podcast, but I really loved it, a simple explanation. Web1 was the democratization of information. Want to know who the 22nd president of America is? Here, use the internet, you can find it. Web 2 was the democratization of publishing. You no longer needed to just go to Google to figure out who the president was. You could go to Twitter, and I could tell you. Anyone had the right and opportunity to tell a story. Web 3 is the democratization of ownership. So for the first time, digitally, you can own something. And what you're owning can represent ownership of something larger. You know, I would say we're not even in the first quarter not even really the first minute of Web3. Uh, there's a lot of regulations that need to come in, in place, uh, but there's an ab abundance of opportunity for what own ownership digitally can do. An example is like Uber. When they, when they were scaling their app, imagine if everyone had a token and people that were riding the Ubers got tokens for riding it. All of a sudden... Five years later, they have a huge company that's scaled. They'll know who took those first rides and maybe actually have ownership in the company or be VIPs in some regard. That's very cool. That's a good example. I didn't hear that one before. But it's like, imagine how many tokens I would have in Uber. I mean, we have all want to get loyalty programs or things for rides. So VFriends, um, just to give context again, setting the stage a little bit, um, is a 
more than 10,000 tokens in the initial one, and then the second one was more than... 55,555. 55 tokens. Um, and so there's a lot of community that own these tokens, but what happens is a lot of NFT projects launch on Discord. And VFriends has one of the largest discords in the world with more than 300 some thousand. Is it? <laughs> Every time I want to say it's the largest, Someone so people, people might seem like, Andy, we're, we're, we're the second. I think, I'll say we're the largest. We have around 380,000 active users in our Discord. It's in, I've never seen anything like it. We'll do a product drop, <laughs> and there's either a lot of anxiety, doubt, or extreme hype and excitement. <clears throat> Thus, the importance of like really having a big team to staff it. Anytime we do, Gary himself needs to be involved in the Discord to put out messages. Um, but it's like real-time customer engagement, 24-7, 365. Yeah, so I want to talk about some of the successes of the project and like the learnings that we can help everyone in the audience listen to, or learn from. So first is building a community. So it's not just you sell them the token. They're essentially now shareholders, and they're a community that you need to constantly stay in touch with. Walk us through some of the things you guys do at VFriends to build and grow and nurture your community. Yeah, I was thinking about this question, knowing that we were probably, you were probably going to ask something like this. Uh, VFriends is a little different because we almost had a baked-in community. You know, and, and how do I think about building community? I think it's putting content out every day on the platforms where people are paying attention in an authentic and meaningful way. Um, and so Gary, with the help of me and Maha and his whole team, have been doing that for a long time. I've worked for him for 10 years, putting out content five times a day on LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and the like. Um, and I think it's the same way for an NFT project. You know, if you today were like, Andy, I really want to launch an NFT project. I know the value that I can provide. I have a really good roadmap and vision. What should I do? Generally, people want to ask, like, how do I build the smart contract? Or what are the pricings? And all that stuff, I think, is actually pretty black and white and easy. The thing that's not easy is getting people to care. And I would say, okay, tomorrow, the first thing you need to do is <laughs> start a Twitter account, start an Instagram account, start a Discord, and try to start building a, a community organically. And do that for a year. <laughs> and then maybe you can have a, a community that will be excited about the NFT that you want to release. Yeah, I think it's a lot of people are excited to start a project, but don't realize, like, once it's on, it's on. And you have to be there for them. So do you guys do 24 hours, time zones? How are you responding in real time? <sighs> we have a really good team. You know, I, v Friends is now almost 40 people. Uh, I have a director of media operations and then uh, a head of community that reports to her. And then, we're th thankfully, uh, we also have a team of volunteer mods too that can just staff our Discord. And it's sort of like a resource hub for even people that aren't VFriends holders to just come in and learn. Learn about NFTs, learn about Gary V, learn about positivity. And it's, it's really inspiring and special to know that people who aren't even our, in our community can come to our community and know that they're going to be well-received. I think it's crazy in Web3 that volunteers run your channels. And so he said the word volunteer mod, so mods are the moderators. So imagine, like, you know, we wouldn't think of that in Web2 of having someone run your Instagram account or your Twitter account that's a volunteer. Talk to us a little bit about how it nat is so native it is and how does that work. Native in, in what regards? To, to, like, in Discord that you have volunteer mods, like. Um, I was going to say something. I'll, I'll go both. Volunteers, you know, uh, Gary puts out a lot of content about work, working for free and volunteering. And it can be sort of a polarizing, especially for creatives. Work for free, Gary, like, what are you talking about? That's terrible. And then people start bashing him. And I am completely on the other side of this camp because I actually tweeted Gary 10 years ago and asked to work for free. And so my biggest advice to college grads, people in college, people that just graduated high school, is to work for free or use your time, rather, to be in a position that you want to be in. You know, if you want to be a fashion designer, find fashion designers that you might want to aspire to, to uh, have a similar career path with and give them your time. You can start off being assistant and then and quickly learn and grow. So 
that's part of the ethos of Be Friends and Gary's messages. Um, so we're grateful to have volunteers that want to learn what does it take to staff a Discord and how do you do customer service. Um, and we just try to come up with programs to make it valuable to them and have check-in points. And then eventually, people always come to us, hey, Andy, I need a Discord moderator. And I'm like, great. And then we give them an opportunity to maybe leave our, our Discord as a community manager and then go on to, to get a full-time job. So I think one of the things that I think vFriends does very well is community. I think the second thing, which I'd love to, to share with everybody, is, is your approach to partnerships and collaborations. So right now we see a lot of brands collaborate in doing drops and doing things together, but it also exists in the NFT world. And you guys have been doing some really big drops. You just did the Macy's, Reebok. Uh, talk to us a little bit about like, why is that important for your community, your brand, and how does, what's the steps you take to, to approach those partnerships and collaborations? I mean, I th over the last, since the inception of vFriends, we were re really using collaborations to legitimize our intellectual property. So the, the first substantial collaboration we did was with Mattel, Mattel and Uno cards. Uno is the biggest game in the world, actually. You know, economically, as a collaboration partner, it wasn't really in vFriends' interest, but none of our collaborations are to date. They're in the interest of growing and scaling the credibility and notoriety of our brand and also to provide value to our holders. Um, what's a recent collaboration we did? I'll take An Anwar Carrots. We, we released a hoodie. He's a streetwear fashion designer based out of L.A. Um, we have a relationship with him. Shoot him a message like, hey, we'd love to collaborate. We have 250 characters. Pick a character you like. And we'll put it on some, like, a, a fashion capsule with a hoodie and a T-shirt. He picked self-aware hair. And then anyone who owns the VFriends self-aware hair token got the capsule for free. Also, Anmar's audience is now being made aware of VFriends. Like, Anmar's brand is called Carrots, which is why he chose self-aware hair as a rabbit. Um, but then all of a sudden, he's posting and sharing about VFriends, and they're seeing this rabbit. And then, inevitably, someone's going to you know, click the profile, see the vFriends tag, and then see, the, uh, hopefully learn about our project and maybe be interested. Yeah, so the, the, the ones that just launched this week alone, just to give you guys context, because they've been a very active machine, is yesterday, is yesterday Friday? What day is it today? Today is Sunday. Yesterday Today's was Sunday. Saturday. Day before yesterday, well, the starter jacket alert ape dropped, which is a really big one. And like a week ago, they did one with Macy's and Toys R Us. Yeah. That was a really big one. So we basically take the digital characters and made them into physical plushies. So genuine giraffe and generous. No, the graceful. Gra six, six different characters. Yeah. You know, and again, Macy's Toys R Us. I know that Toys R when I, I don't want to grow up. I know that's. Toys R Us, kid. Exactly. Better singer than I. Uh, <laughs> iconic brand. Macy's actually just bought Toys R Us, and now every Toys R Us is a store within a store inside of Macy's. We are not doing that collaboration for the revenue opportunities, though they exist. We're doing it strictly because of the QR code that is on the plush stuffed animals and figurines, which leads to a two-minute short about Genuine Giraffe or Gratitude Gorilla, because we want to try to make the world fall in love with these characters. You know, that is the sole mission of vFriends. If, if a, a, a child who goes into Toys R Us or a mom who goes into Toys R Us and picks up Genuine Giraffe and then gives them that for their birthday or for Christmas and then they learn about what, what does it mean to be genuine and then maybe they admire that trait and they understand that being genuine is, is admirable and it's something that they aspire to and then they can fall in love with that character and hopefully we can build a legacy of making kindness cool and, and genuine cool uh, and a notable IP brand. So let's talk about that. So the, the whole point of vFriends is to make kindness cool and genuine cool and all this kind of stuff. How does that, how are, what's the challenges of building and scaling traits about positivity in a very negative world? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really, really interesting. Gary, uh, you may or may not follow him or know his content, but he is what I would call like an alpha male. He cusses. He's very brash. A lot of people can instantly be like, I do not like that guy. My mom was one of them for a while. 
Um, like, why are you working for him? He's, why is he always yelling? But my family said the same thing. They're like, what is that? And then when my mom actually met him, she's like, he's so present and so aware and so nice. I'm like, yeah, he's actually a good guy. Um, candidly, I, the challenge that I'm going through right now that operationally we're going to have to continue to face and think about is who is the V Friends audience? You know, when you think about genuine giraffe or empathy elephant or kind kudu or gratitude gorilla, it generally feels like it's made for kids. You know, kids are going to be the ones that fall in love with the characters. And we also release collectible trading cards, um, which I've been taken aback by how well they're performing around kids. You know, there's a big uh, comparison to what we're trying to do with those trading cards as with, like, Pokemon cards, which have a huge secondary market value. Um, But kids are more drawn to almost V-Friends cards than Pokemon cards because they're more relatable. Everyone knows what Karen Camel is more so than Pikachu or Charizard. But it's also aged down our brand a lot. Most of these kids are five, six, seven, eight years old. So, you know, Gary's ambitions is also to have a 17-year-old male or female love V friends. So just strategically thinking about how we can tell stories that would be relevant to all ages. I think it kind of talks a little bit about the arc of the story. And in my job and with the company is doing the storytelling, doing the communications, doing the PR, helping them find the message and the narrative so that everyone can understand it. And we've really gone from NFT company, so we were launched as an NFT company, making the shift into this IP company. So we're, we may have been targeting crypto people who are investors in crypto and buying ETH who are collecting NFTs into sort of mainstream media to talk about why parents and kids need to know about these traits, how companies should be buying these products as like gifts for their employees to teach them. One of the gifts, one of the character, the plushies is called be the bigger person. So when you get a situation, how can you be a bigger person and rise above? So really trying to take the ideas of what they were doing on the NFT community and in the Web3 community and bring it and push it into the mainstream so that more people adopt the things that we're trying to share. Like at the end of the day, you know, name a business person that you guys know who goes out who just talks about happiness all the time. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, <laughs> to, to, to get Gary to go on television to talk about happiness and kindness. Like, no, news organizations want things that are, you know, catching attention, what people want to know, what people need to know, breaking news, exclusives, drama. They don't want to be reporting about happiness and kindness and because that's not cool but now I think as the conversations are changing and more people are embracing mental wellness and health and and balancing yourself and so people are thinking about what they need to do to be happy and so I think that the conversations and the videos and the way that we're trying to do the storytelling is going to have its place in history as really changing how people think about happiness and kindness and empathy and and some of the things that are and the traits of the the book one of the biggest not just the book but he has a book um patient panda you know teaching people patience and teaching people about these traits um let's go into a little bit about talking about your job as the president of the company operations uh you started from zero it's essentially a startup it still is a startup even though you work for a company that has a big machine behind it, what have been some of the challenges in building and operating it? Uh, in the, you've been on that now for almost two years, year and a half. Um, just the, the keeping up with the speed and the change and the growth. You know, the space itself is changing every day. New scams, new opportunities, new platforms. Um, and we need to be a leader in that space. We single-handedly basically put our community onto NFTs in the blockchain, and when there's a new platform coming out that you can buy a friend on, I'll get a text about it, and I don't even know what it is yet, and I'm supposed to have a response about what we want to do with it. So I think just keeping up with the, the rate of change and how we can effectively communicate what the best approach is and why and rationales as to why, and then... Honestly, hiring, you know, we were able to build VFriends to what it is uh, 2021 up until VCon with really like 11 people, which is way too small of amount. Everyone was doing three jobs, but the reason I liked it that way is because I trusted single-handedly everyone that I had around me. 
And when you, when you have trust, you can move really fast. Um, so now we're scaling, you know, over the last two, three months, we've hired 20 people. So that's going to be a whole new challenge of having more senior leadership. How am I able to manage them and, and allow the people below them to flourish? Um, but hopefully all good things. What is the one when you were at Vayner? So Andy, before he was at V Friends, was running Gary's brand. Um, and I know because I know you is that you were in charge of a lot of hiring. Uh, what was that process like? And what do you look for when hiring people? Yeah, I've had the privilege, honestly, to hire lots of I probably hired like 50 people, all of them entry level employees. First first job out of college. And I, I think whether it's an entry level or senior executive, the truth about hiring is you never really know. I'll have an interview with someone. They, I might even give them a little sample quiz or test they have to take. I'm like, they are awesome. Let's hire them. And then three weeks later, I'm like, they're not going to make it. <laughs> you just, you know, you really need to work with them. You know, I try to, I try to have other people, of course, interview and, and we gather feedback and consensus and pros and cons. But really, you just got to see how they operate and what happens when a a problem comes their way. How do they respond? So if you have the opportunity, I love, that's why I love internships. You know, having someone young come in and work for three months allows me to have some separation of not feeling like I'm committed to their career growth. Versus if I hire someone, I feel indebted to, even after three weeks, I'm like, oh my gosh, Mike is not going to work out. But I felt like I hired Mike, and I'm responsible for his success, and I want him to be great. But that's never the move. You know, you have to <laughs> peel the bandaid off and let Mike know what it is. And creating internships and things of that nature has made it a lot easier for me, at least as a manager, to have those conversations. When you're um, the hiring and the training process and kind of building people, what are some of the essential things that you look for, like, in that process? <sighs> the traits and qualities of V-Friends. Uh, you know, the soft skills are actually the hard skills. H- how patient are they? How empathetic are they? How kind are they? And you do that through just questions, you know. And, and I, I love, of course, if they can back up that they have the skill sets or the experience based on their resumes and portfolio. That will always be great. But really, it honestly comes down to skill sets and, and I think the most, sorry, emotional intelligence, broadly speaking. And I think the number one uh, quality I look for is curiosity, especially where we are with VFriends. But I think in, in general, if you're curious, that probably means you're going to be more proactive. You're probably going to be a little more self-aware and you're going to be a little more eager and ambitious to get things done. I'm going to ask you a trick question now, and I've told you that I'm going to ask you a trick question, but what's your favorite VFriend character? All of them. Um, honestly, it, it really changes. It depends on my mood. I'll say that my favorite V-Friend character, emotionally to me, is probably a character called Forever Phoenix, because it is the NFT V-Friend that Gary gifted me after we launched V-Friends. Um, he gave me congratulations, and then he asked me what my wallet address was, and then he sent me this, this character, Forever Phoenix. And uh, I really like it. And for, the, the significance of Forever Phoenix is basically Gary in a twisted and almost sick kind of way says he would fantasize about you know building the biggest business ever and then it failing blowing up everything goes to zero and then quickly all all the i sold you to i I told you so's and haters and doubters would come out and say see gary he's just a hoax person or whatever but he's going to rise back like a phoenix and remind everyone that he actually is an operator and he's a capable entrepreneur and it's not a facade and it's not something that uh, can be taken away because it's an innate skill set within him. And that's how, that's how I think about that character and that's something that I think about with myself too. If V friends disappear tomorrow, I feel confident in my skills uh, to do something different and continue to build and rise. Uh, Gary gifted me the passionate parrot. And that's my favorite character. Um, it's, I want... also, it's also one of the best drawings. The Passionate Parrot? Yeah, it was funny when Gary was drawing and creating all the V-Friends. Some, he, <laughs> we had a limited amount of time. We had to drew 283 characters. Sometimes he would start and like rip it up. Uh, and other times he would draw a character for like an hour. And I'd be like nudging him, Gary, hurry up. But Passionate Parrot, fully colored, 
It's a beautiful parrot, and it is passionate. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, I want to talk two more questions, and then we'll take some from the audience. Um, your personal growth as a leader and how, you know, a lot of people who have, some people who have been following you just understanding, like, ambitions for vFriends. Where do you think you want to take it? What's next? Walk us into, like, the future of vFriends. The future of vFriends. Um, it's, it's coming down to hiring. You know, like, as I said, we've hired, we just staffed uh, – an events division with two executive vice presidents. I've never managed, you know, VPs and SVPs before, um, but I'm excited to. It, it's it's uh, rewarding, and it makes me feel really good when I jump onto a Zoom or a call, and everything is running smoothly. And I'm and I'm not used to having operational excellency like that around me. Um, and I think that's also the challenge. You know, those are the people that I have to lead and inspire now. Um, but Gary's always there, and I, I always think it's like one hand up, one hand down. You know, Gary always has a hand, a hand down for me to lift everyone up, and, and I try to do that for everyone below me. And aside from that, it's uh, just thinking about the best ways we can storytell and storytell what people are paying attention. You know, we are constantly brainstorming how we want to be better at putting out content on TikTok. Um, I would say, yeah. TikTok content is top priority for me and V friends right now. Last question: Egypt, impressions of Egypt. It's a beautiful place, a historical place. I, I had the honor a year ago actually to go to Dubai, and that was my first time in the region. And I'm grateful for that because being there, I felt like taught me a lot about the Middle East and Arab culture. And so, coming here, I had a little bit of context, but now I understand better. And I was actually speaking with someone last night about NFTs, and he was saying that they're really taking off in Dubai, um, which made sense to me. But, and I felt happy that I could say this because I, I understand it. I know a little bit about the history and the context. I was like, yeah, it's happening in Dubai, but where, where it really needs to be happening is in Egypt because Egypt is where they have the cultural stories uh, and legacy of cultural stories, uh, music, film, cinema, to be really utilizing NFTs and the technology. He's like, oh, yeah, I totally agree. And just, uh, and, uh, yeah. That's a very good story, very good contest. Thanks, you guys. Do you want to take some questions? Anyone have any questions for us? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you both for putting the time and uh, to make such a move and introduce uh, VFRAINS and NFT in general uh, to Egyptian community. And I have two, uh, two questions, actually. Um, what makes uh, a project or an NFT project worth uh, joining? Uh, for example, you, you see projects like uh, uh, Board Ape and uh, uh, CryptoPunks. What things that uh, distinguish them and... Uh, and make them uh, like high, high valuable, you know. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like what? What? The question, sorry. He's asking what makes an NFT project uh, worth investing in and high value. Um, this might be a little long-winded, so I apologize. But DeFi, decentralized finance, and all these cryptocurrencies really took off in like 2017 in a big way. People were trading, making money, and then everything collapsed. I wasn't really involved in the space at all, but I think what was happening then, which was basically trying to maximize like financial arbitration to try and make a lot of money, strictly. Uh, I think a lot of that behavior was happening with NFTs, but even at a higher scale because it had characters and artwork connected it which made it more emotionally relevant to humans. Where like all of a sudden I wasn't buying some random altcoin. I was buying a CryptoPunk or a Bored Ape or a World of Women. Um, so I think one is a lot of speculation and just trying to maximize gains and money and then flip and trade, which is dangerous. Um, and then two, who the people are behind the project or how they're able to communicate and manage the company and brand. You know, Bored Ape amongst everyone, I, I feel like they had artwork that resonated with people. And then they were able to really navigate communicating uh, a different 
type of style, but also what they think the future of Bored Ape is going to be. Um, crypto punks, I feel like, are in a completely different category, and people will disagree with me all the time on this. I, don't, I think crypto, crypto punks could do nothing, and they would continue to maintain value because they have the his, history on their side. You know, I think they're like the Mona Lisa of, of NFTs. They're the first NFT project, the first NFTs ever on Ethereum with 10,000 uh, as a PFP project. So. Yeah, so to be, I, for me, for the answer on that is like people invest in people. They don't invest in companies. So like an entrepreneur of a company that you want to invest in, who are the founders of that company? Are they the ones that can take it to the next level? Are they actually going to build something ongoing for their community? And that's why you'll see, especially with VFriends, and there's a couple other projects that are good at this too, they launch, but they're constantly trying to make sure that they stay in touch with the community, bring value to them, bring value to them, bring value to them. So when you're looking to invest, look at the project, look at the founders, what activities have they done so far, and see where you think you want to invest based on the decisions that they've made so far. You had a second question. Yeah. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the implementation of blockchain uh, away from like building a community? Because I know everything can be tokenized, right? Like uh, for example, you can have you can tokenize your passport or uh, legal documentation. So, what are your thoughts on that? So he's asking about the tokenization of everything using blockchain technology and smart contracts. I think it's the future of the internet. <laughs> you know, I think. Ticketing, obviously, I'm very bullish on. I think specifically in American sports, it's, it's hard for me not to imagine a world in which in a few years' time, the tickets that you will go to an NBA playoff game will be an NFT. Because let's say I go to that playoff game and Luka Donovic, who's one of the best basketball players in the world, hits a game-winning three, and the Mavericks go on to the NBA Finals because of that, that ticket is, will have value after that game. For the, for the people of the world who really love Mavericks and Luca, they want to collect and own that. So I could go to the game, experience it, not really be a collector, sell it, and make money from my experience, but also as a business opportunity for the NBA and the Mavericks, they're going to get royalties from every time that ticket sells. I'm also really bullish on you know, authentication of luxury items. So coach bag, a Rolex watch. If you buy a Rolex right now, it's going to come with like expensive plastic to tell you that it's a real Rolex. It can be faked and it, it is being faked versus you buy the Rolex and it's going to come with an NFT, which can never be faked. And it's always going to be verifiably authentic. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll buy the Rolex from you, but I want to see the NFT that's supposed to come with it. Yeah. I bought a sweater in New York, a luxury sweater brand, and it came with a uh, as a tag on the price tag and then it came with a little booklet and said this sweater was authenticated on the blockchain here's the address to prove that it's a real it's a re, it was a Prada but it was that it was real and I'd never in my life seen that before and so I posted I'm like I I got my first piece of clothing and I can verify the ownership of the blockchain that it's not fake I thought I, that was crazy I think whether it's three years four years seven years NFT is not going to be a word anymore. You know, it's just going to be an everyday activity where you consume and buy things on the internet. It still seems so foreign. Like, I own something digitally? What does that mean? But, uh, and it's also due to the price points. You know, you see these headlines of someone bought a monkey for $100,000, <laughs> and it doesn't, it does not, you know, and it, immediately people are like, it's a scam, it's fake, whatever. But I'm excited about $2 NFTs. Because it's, it's a collectible and maybe it's a proof that you came to a talk with Maha and Andy or that is going to allow you to go to a restaurant and get a free meal. But it'll be like a, a memento that you can keep with you forever. Yeah, and I think to his point, like, the terms will also probably change. Like, World Wide Web used to be what we used to call the Internet. We used to call it the information superhighway. We don't call it that anymore. But, like, I think so the, the term NFT also might change. Any other questions? I don't need the book. That's fine. <laughs> so I have a question. First of all, thank you so much for coming to Egypt. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. Hey, what's up, guys? Yay. <laughs> uh, so, so building like a company like V Friends, 
when you guys start, do you guys have plans to be profitable at a certain point? Or, or it's not even in the plans when you start, and there's, like, different KPIs? Um, I mean, we knew... When we were launching vFriends, it was really stressful because we were behind schedule. It was new technology, and we had to keep on updating the pricing because the price of ETH kept on going up. But we had priced the value of vFriends based on how much it would be to come to the conference, strictly. It was about $2,000, and that was the value of what it would be to come to VCon for three years. Um, so I knew if all vFriends sold out based on the pricing model, how much money we were going to make. We actually, I think, missed, I think we would have made a lot more if the website would have been on time. But two, we actually had, and Gary gives our CTO a very hard time about this, on MetaMask, there's a suggested gas price, and it was locked in at something that was really, really high. And we actually had something called a reverse Dutch auction where every V friend started at a price and every second it started lowering in price. And we had done so much promotion for that day and that moment in time for everyone to buy. And they were going to be buying at a high price. But then they saw that that gas was so high and they stopped for a second. And then it took us 23 days to sell out. And when I... When I say that to people who really know the space and really know vFriends and know where we are as a blue chip NFT project, they say, damn, because <laughs> they, they wish they would have been able to buy a vFriend for the floor price of, of 0.5 ETH. Um, and then Series 2. So we always have math and modeling, and now we're, we have a real P&L. You know, we have a 40-person company and an annual conference and are doing more access events. It's a, a growing company, and it will end up being a very large company. It's also like any other company where you want to get seed investors and you need to like really build and grow your company to scale to, at that stage. They got an investment as well to help build out their creative engine so that they can do animated films and TV shows and children's books and toys and really build the next Disney, the next Hello Kitty. That is the ambition of the company. And so you need to... You know, eventually you can sell your NFTs, but you need to have other vehicles to, to build and grow and scale your business. Uh, yeah, Nuran. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you for all the time that you took to explain how uh, vFriends are working. Uh, my name is Nuran Awais. I'm an illustrator. I'm digital, and I'm also a business owner. And um, I've got the opportunity to work with top brands in terms of illustrations and stuff like that. But at, at the same time, I'm currently exploring how NFT works and all of that. It's still very new to me, but I'm keen to understand how it works to maybe at some point I would have my own collectible or something like that. But at the same time, I feel that um, it's still, I, I'm still having difficulty grasping what it is exactly and how it works. So I would like to know, because you mentioned that only like, Maybe two years ago, you weren't very familiar with all of this. So what helped you shift your mind to understand how this industry works? And um, what are your advices for people like me to be able to get into that industry maybe faster than you? <laughs> and uh, what advice you would give me for someone who's an artist, who's an illustrator, and who's keen to have something in that industry in the future? Um, that's one thing. I'm also curious to understand who illustrates the characters at VFriends. Like, I want to know. Like, I just searched now the characters to see how they look like. Very interesting. And I'm just keen to understand who does that work as an artist. And if this is v uh, Gary himself or if it's a team... I just need to understand how things like that work. Okay, first of all, if you guys don't follow Nuran on Instagram, she's an extremely talented illustrator. A lot of her stuff has been by big studios, so having, I want to give context to her. So let me lead the question since I know she asked a lot. So the first one is when Andy was new to the industry and like how do you learn, what's the best way to get up to speed to learn about NFTs and the NFT industry? Yeah, I was, I'm going to try to give an answer to both at the same time, actually. And your other question was, like, how do you maybe get to a place where you might be able to have your own collection in notoriety? I think, like, I would storytell 
your journey of learning about NFTs and about Web3 while doing it in real time. Thus, you yourself are learning about it, but you're gaining awareness, storytelling about how you're learning about it. Um, you know, I, I literally would just go to YouTube and I'd find a podcast and I would listen to the podcast. And then afterwards, I might have two questions that I still didn't grasp. And then I would try to f- talk to other people and fig- figure out like how they articulated it. It was really just consumption of finding two or three creators that I really liked and then coming up with some follow-up questions. Um, I also think you don't have to, you know, if we asked everyone in the room right now to explain what the internet is and how it works, my assumption is we would get really bad answers. (laughs) You know, it's just because it's become so consumer friendly and so easy, you know, as an artist and a storyteller and a creator, I think that's the only thing you really need to focus on, you know, Yes, you want to have other smart people around you who have other skill sets, developers, things of that nature. But as long as you, at a high level, grasp that it's something on the Internet that people can own and sell and trade and you can always know who owns it, you're good to go. You know? and, and aside from that, get recommendations from other podcasts and creators to listen. There's uh, an emerging market of people in the space covering the space Carly Riley is someone that I recommend. I really love her podcast. Um, but aside from that, I think it's just taking very seriously in your own way how you can storytell on platforms. Yeah, I think for me, when I came to learn about this space, I just I learned a lot from Twitter. So Twitter is one of the main platforms for NFTs. And all you should do is go into the search and just put NFTs, and it'll start giving you people, and you can start following accounts. I also listen to the Bankless podcast, the A16Z podcast. Those are like real good educational ones that talk about the macro industry. And then start um, going into some of the discords of some of the projects. It's really a good way to learn. Go into the VFriends discord, go into the CryptoPunks discord, go into Doodles discord. Like getting into the community and being a good listener is a really good way to learn because you're exposed to the conversations. What are they asking? There's a lot of newbies. So that's a, the way that I go in to learn is I just go in where the communities are talking and just try to like figure it out. And then you'll go down the rabbit hole and find someone you like and follow them and just learn and grow organically from that. 100%. I think Elon Musk is very polarizing, so I'll just put that on the side over there. I, I think it's good. I'm tired of most social media platforms right now. I've, I've spent the last 10 years really, really thinking about how to maximize exposure, awareness, strategies on content distribution on these platforms, and they just feel stale and old for me and, and not as relevant. And I feel like if there's anyone who, who might garner a new way to, to use platforms, it'll be someone like Elon um, my friend Jim's in the audience, and I was telling him this yesterday. I'm excited, but there's so much fake news, fake profiles. Johnny Pants 422, who wants to say that you're stupid or ugly or fat or whatever, and and I don't think that's conducive to a town hall environment, which I think is really good. You know, you want a public town hall where people can story tell and go back and forth and disagree. Disagreement's good, but it's not so good when there's fake profiles who are trying to seed disinformation and overthrow democracies, which is what's happening. Elon has talked about it. I've seen threads about it. Of If you want to have an account on the social media, you need to verify who you are as an individual. You have to upload your passport, create your profile, and I feel like that would instantly... Johnny Pants 42 too is not going to be leaving all these hateful comments because he's going to know that everyone's going to know that that's the kind of person he is online and in person. You know, just... So I'm, I'm excited. I think the evolution of the internet and Web3 is yet to really be with uh, Web2. I don't know what's going to happen with Meta. Everyone's given Mark a hard time with the, the name change, and it's not there yet. But I think it's an, I think it's an exciting time. And, and I'm honestly, selfishly, I, I think it's, it's good for Twitter that they've changed. Yeah. Who does the characters? Oh, yeah. Gary Drew... All the characters, himself. originally himself. From there, they are now, they've been evolved. We hired an agency, essentially, to design 
the characters into their series two form, fully colored, vectorized, um, and now internally we make the content. So we have a team of animators, designers, graphic designers, um, and then we still are building a character brand book, which is taking time. You know, we're, we're halfway through it, and this is, this is full transparency on where we are as a company. We're halfway through the brand book of our characters, and we're in year two. But there's 250, and we have meetings with Gary, and we say, all right, trusting Tarantula, <laughs> go. You know, and then he just articulates why Tarantula, why trusting, what does trusting mean, how does he want this character to come to life, you know, does he think of it more as a five to eight year old character, is it uh, an adult character, and it's fascinating, he surprised me, sometimes I'm like, he doesn't know what this character is, because I've spent so much time on him, but he knows, and he, he was very specific about the traits and attributes he used, why he drew them with things, you know, a lot of the characters have little hidden uh, secrets within them, so... It's, it's going to be a fun journey over the next 40 years of just seeing these characters evolve in the ways in which all of them come to life differently. This is advice to you, but for anybody who wants to get in the space who's an illustrator designer, is start creating. Start creating and, you know, post about it, and then maybe they might see it, and then they might hire you. No, because that's one way that Gary hires a lot of people as fans or people who have been creating content, creating videos, because you know his business. You follow him. You see him. So if anybody wants to get into any company, not be friends, but any company, start producing, creating some stuff for them in your free time, showing them, I know how to do this. This is what I can create for you. I know for Gary V. Arabic, the page that we started for Gary, I started that a couple years ago. That's what we did and initially. We brought in some people who had been following him and who were volunteers who said they want to run the page and they can create content and subtitles for Gary and they did it for free and then now they work for the company. But I'm just saying like it's a really good way to show a business or a brand you want to tell their stories is by actually doing it yourself. Fully agree. You could, I mean, if you wanted to, tonight you could go home and mint and create your own NFT. And you could say, this is my first NFT and I'm going to make one tomorrow. You know, and that could start a series of learnings and maybe even a community of collectors. Any other questions Oh, we have over here? I don't even know what time it is, so what time are we doing on time? Okay. We got a little, yes. The spike that happened in the price of Ethereum? In Doge, yeah, for sure. Gary, Elon had said that uh, you know they might start accepting. It might become a payment, like almost like a, a competitor to Venmo. Do you all use the Venmo in Egypt? No. Cash App? No. We have something similar to it. Yeah. Something similar. Um, yeah. But they might start doing that. So again, it's just speculation. Speculation is very, very dangerous. But people think. Elon likes Doge. He's going to pump Doge on Twitter and everyone buy it. I think it's short-term thinking. Yeah. Five of my favorite projects. V friends, V friends, V friends, V friends, V friends. <laughs> the end. Yeah. Hi, Andy. Hi, I'm, I'm Aha. I just wanted to ask a question regarding when you said that um, she, for example, can create an NFT, let's say in Anyone in this room can create an NFT in, in two minutes, but the, the value or the, the, the promotion where you can actually promote that NFT, it's, it's not that easy. You know, there are marketing considerations, there are legal considerations, there are so many things that need to be in place for you to be able to actually scale it and reach a bigger audience. So back in the day when you launched vFriends, it was actually a, a bull market in like, let's say in, in crypto where everyone was focused on the Web3 and Discord and grinding Discords and all that. Right now, things are changing. Um, a lot of projects are selling out in, in ways that are very similar to Web2, where they're basically using paid ads or, or using other marketing forms to actually be able to grow their audience because Discord, just having a, a large Discord, Discord doesn't cut it anymore. So what do you have to say about that for new projects that are starting in this space? How should they approach it? Is it a, a Web 2.5, let's say, strategy like Gary mentions, or is it both Web 2 and Web 3 to be able to capitalize on all that audience? It's Web 2. 
you know, I mean, Web 2.5 is to be able to have a, a better relationship with the people that have your tokens, but TikTok is an insane platform. Like, I was asking my friend Ali, who's here, he's been traveling with Maha and I, and I knew the answer, but I'm like, hey, Ali, is TikTok big in Egypt? And he, like, laughed out loud. He's like, this is huge. And it's, it's because they've given the opportunity for extreme free distribution. You don't need to be Gary V. You don't need to be Ava Longoria to have a big audience if you have a story to tell. You know, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier is like, if she wanted to create an NFT project, the first thing that I would really think about is how are you growing your own audience and community? You know, and whether she wanted to be, if, she, if you're like, I, I don't like video, I don't like being on camera, that's not me, I wouldn't recommend going on TikTokness. Actually, TikTok has a lot of ways to storytell. You can do animations without you ever having to appear on the camera. There's tons of ways to storytell, but it all has to come down to you naturally. So I think the market's down right now, which is actually a really good time to be learning and studying and then working on your craft into Web 2 to garner the opportunity to have an at-bat to execute in Web 3. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, Gary talks a lot about the tiff TikTokification across all platforms. Like everyone's trying to emulate what they do where you capture in the first three seconds and, and the trends and all that kind of stuff. So I think you can think on the platforms too. It's, I mean, this is why it's fun working for Gary and, and seeing what's happened over the last 10 years. He wrote a book called Crush It, um, I think maybe 2012. It's, it's, it was basically how to cash in on your passions how you can make money online sharing and, and storytelling around your passions as a YouTube creator or whatever. If you go to Amazon right now and look at the reviews of that book, there are people who say that like he's a scam artist and he's full of bogey, baloney, and no one will ever make money on the internet storytelling. And when Maha says the tick, TikTokification of society, it's true because I, I'm almost positive there's someone on TikTok right now who's telling you how to make the best almond milk. That's what they do. It's such a long tail of interest where you can literally, if you like almond milk and you are passionate about talking about almond milk, that could be your career for the rest of your life. Because you just want to, and now you can have an NFT and that NFT will represent the almond milk. You know, it's really understanding who you are, what you want about, and how can you storytell it. You know, I think everyone's job is your profession, comma, storyteller. And I think just on your point about the marketing that you need and on, for my where the communications hat, like it's, it's multiple layers. So you need to have a good website. You need to have a good social media team. You need to have a good discord. You have to have someone talking to the press. You have to have personal brands. So like the founders have to have good social where they're out educating. So like the, you have to have all of those things in line before you even start to do paid. So we call them like the communications foundations and they all have to sing together and be consistent across each other. Um, and then you have to do stuff like this, like going out and speaking and talking to smaller groups and the hand-to-hand -hand combat of talking to your community and meeting them publicly at events. It's so important because it takes your brand and takes it to make a new connection with that user or that community and I think just the brands who do it well just think of any brand that you follow that you like why do you like following them and how do you because you're they communicate well to you or they connect with you so your nft project your web3 project has to do the same just like it would be in any other case everyone starts with zero followers <laughs> You know, yeah. Gary used to talk a lot about how a lot of celebrities don't like going on social media because they don't want to start with zero followers. You know, Jennifer Aniston just came on like last year during the pandemic and the first day and she got like a million. It's like, okay, she's a big time. She'll, she'll get it for her name. But a lot of people don't have that kind of clout. And I, I said that because it's, it can be daunting. NFTs, thinking about how to, how to get in the space. And my biggest adv advice is to just start. You know, people, I always used to get DMs. And I, made, I did like a rant one time about it, about Gary was doing all these podcasts about creating podcasts. Like number one arbitrage in marketing right now is creating a podcast. Inherently, people know I work for Gary, they would DM me. Andy, how do I start a podcast? Andy, how do I start a podcast? And I, I got so annoyed eventually because I'm like, dude, you, you, you just start. You can literally on, take out your phone. They have a voice recording app. 
record on your phone, and you can then hit upload. <laughs> it's very, very simple, but the more you think about it and the more you don't dip your toes in it, the harder it is. And it's like creating an NFT. All of us tonight could go home, go to YouTube, watch a video on OpenSea about how you can mint an NFT, and we would make our first NFT. But we're hesitant because we want to do it perfect or we want to have a certain amount of followers. And it's all a balance. But the biggest lesson that I've learned from Gary in a lot of ways is to literally just press the button. Just start. I'm going to have a, a, a shameless plug for my podcast. Please. <laughs> if you guys want to listen to my podcast, it's called Savvy Talk. Yusuf also has a very good podcast, Yusuf Subri. You guys, we've taken your time, and we're so grateful to have you here. Follow Cranak, K-R-A-I-N-A-K, on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Maha Geber. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much.